I'm glad that you're here with us to celebrate on another Sunday, and we're in the midst of the series, Uncommon Joy. And this is part two, and it's all about the win-win situation. You know, we all face different situations. Sometimes the difficult ones would be lose-lose. Now, I've been in a few of those situations. I remember back into like junior high, now this is a long time ago, and in the junior high we had, uh, if you got in trouble, which I occasionally did, you could either have a detention, which was for 30 minutes, and then you'd miss the beginning of sports, or you could take a paddling. To me, it was lose, lose. I mean, there's, not, there's no win there. But, but oftentimes I had to take the paddling because, um, you know, I could, get, then I could you could go to play sports or do something else after school right away. And the pain only lasted for, well, quite honestly, it lasted longer than I thought it would. But, uh, so that's lose, lose. But sometimes there's lose, win. So for a year or two, we lived with my grandparents and as our house was being built, and living with them, my grandpa had this big garden, just all kinds of vegetables and different fruit, different things in their orchard and stuff like this. And so it was, we were eating a lot of those things that I wasn't quite used to them. And the one thing I just detested was tomatoes. But because my grandpa had a small acreage and a farm and a barn, I wanted a pig. So he made a deal with me. He says, John, if you eat tomatoes all summer, then I will get you a pig. And so um, I tried, I gagged and gagged and gagged to try to get a tomato down. To this day, I still can't eat a tomato. But, but I, 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 that was like, that was the lose. But see, the win was so big that I kept trying to do that just so I could get the pig, which I did eventually get the pig that fall. Sometimes there's win-win situations. Those are the best one. And what this message is really talking about today is a win-win. And the win-win for me was Thanksgiving. We would go to my mom's parents' house, my grandparents, and we would have this great Thanksgiving meal. And the win-win is this, get this. Well, John, would you like pecan pie or sugar pie? It's a win-win. I mean, you, you can't lose at that. Sometimes it was, you know, pecan pie, sugar pie, or pumpkin pie. I mean, it's win-win-win. I mean, those are the kind of decisions we like. Now, here's the amazing thing. As we were talking about last week, if, you, if you're in jail, prison, as Paul was, as he writes this letter to the church at Philippi, well, that's a stressful situation, and yet the most amazing thing happens is that it seems as though Paul has a great deal of joy as he's in jail. And it be, it's because what we're going to find out here at the end of the day is that he has realized that life for him, even though he is not able to have the freedoms that he once enjoyed, he has a win-win situation in front of him. And so I want to take you to Philippians chapter 1. We're going to build to his decisions because Paul is really trying to share some foundational truths to our faith that lead him to the conclusion and hopefully leads us in our life to the same conclusion that he has that we're, it's going to come down to a win-win situation. He, in Philippians 1 Chapter 1, verse 6, he says, And I am certain that God, who began the good work within you, writing to the church at Philippi, to all those believers, will continue his work until it is finished on the day when Christ Jesus returns. Paul is convinced, that's another word we could use here for certain, he is convinced that God, because of his character, his nature, the way that other people have responded in the faith, that God just is continuing the work that he began. Now, this is such an important foundational truth for Paul because he realized that it is only God who does the work. So God initiates the work within our lives. 
We would call that within the Methodist faith, we would call that the prevenient grace of God. It is God's grace going out into our life, drawing us closer and closer to God till we will make that decision to allow Jesus to be the Lord of our life. And he will continue that work. So he doesn't just stop. He continues the work until it is finished, until our life ends or when Jesus comes back. He's gonna continue working on us. I want you to know right now, you might be watching this and you've had a difficult week, a difficult month, a difficult three months. It may seem like you don't know where God is. And maybe in this time when you think, well, maybe I could have grown in my faith, I actually didn't. Maybe I even went the opposite way. I want you to know, and I hope that you'll take hope in this today, God is still at work in your life, in my life. He never stops. He he doesn't give up. He is always working on us. He never becomes bored with working on us and lay us aside. He never becomes so disappointed that he completely gives up and says, oh, that's beyond repair. It's never gonna happen in your life and in my life. Doesn't matter where we go. God began the work. He's pursuing us. He's always there trying to draw us closer to him. And, And I love this point about this verse. God finishes what he starts. He always finishes it. God is at work, and Paul wants the church to know that. And this is, even though he's in jail, he understands that this is what really gives them great freedom, is to know that Jesus is at work in their life. It's in Ephesians, another book that Paul writes. Now here he's writing to the church at Ephesus, in which he summarizes, and a number of people would say that this is one of those great little summaries of the gospel message. Notice what Paul says, because there's a key here. God saved you by his grace when you believed. Just kind of remember that word believed, or if you have your Bible, just underline that. You can't take credit for this, the scripture says. It's a gift from God. In other words, this faith that we have is a gift from God when we believe. Salvation is not a reward for the good things we've done. So none of us can boast about it. It's exactly what Paul was writing to the church at Philippi. God began the work, it's his work, and he's gonna continue to do that work in our life. You see, it's not this reward for good things we've done. God's not looking at my life and said, John, you did this, you did this, you were a pastor, great man, come on into heaven. You know, he's not saying to Billy Graham or Mother Teresa or anyone else that you might think has lived like that. It's not a reward because they did all these great things. No, it is simply the receiving, the believing in what Jesus has done for us, his grace, his love. And then Paul concludes this section by saying, for we are God's masterpiece. See, he's he's not stopped yet. Keep working. From God's perspective, we're a masterpiece. We might not feel like a masterpiece. We may feel completely the opposite of that. We may feel like some just some art that was created with just slop paint just thrown at a canvas, and that's what our life kind of represents right now. But God says, no, wait a minute. From my perspective, because I began this painting in your life, that you're a masterpiece. He has created us anew in Jesus. For all of those, and that key word was believed. To all of us who put our faith in it, who who literally said, Lord, I give up. It's you I put my faith and my trust in. There was this man, and he got lost in the desert. And he was stumbling around, he was getting to the point where he desperately needed water. And and there were moments where it was kind of like a mirage would appear on the horizon and he would walk to it only to reach down and pull up what he thought might be a glass of water, but it was just a handful of sand. But miraculously, as he went over one sand dune, he saw what appeared to be a shack. 
and he went down to the shack and and he he it would give him, I mean, it was, it was not much of it was left. I mean, it was really, Shaq is really being generous with this description, but he sat down next to one of the boards, which provided him a little bit of shade. And he, he is so thirsty. If he could just have something, when all of a sudden, he notices about 15 feet away, next to like a little dead shrub, is what looks to him to be a well and a pump for a well. With all the excitement that you can imagine he had, he sprung to his feet, he walked over there, and he began to just crank that old pump handle up and down, up and down. But nothing came out. This old rusty pump handle, he thought, well, that, it's not going to be any good. He goes back and he sits down and notices that just around the, the, the corner of the shed is, is, a, is a large jug, about a gallon really, large jug that had a cork in the top of it. And so he grabs this jug and he holds it up and there was some writing on it, but it was so dusty he just kind of brushes it off real fast and he looks at the words and it says, this is to prime the pump. You have to use all of it. Pour it in the pump. Now immediately, he's kind of faced, in one sense you might say, with a bit of a win-win situation. You see, he has enough water that it can keep him alive. I mean, a gallon of water goes a long way in the desert. But then if you put that in the pump, if that really was true, but you don't know if it's true, I mean, the writing was old. Do you believe it? Will you still follow it? And and then anybody could, but if it worked, he would have all kinds of water, so he has this dilemma to make. And finally, he says um, to himself, I'm going to die out here anyways. I might as well. Take a chance. And as he lifts the bottle up to pour it in the well, he notices, it says P.S. Make sure before you're done, fill the jug up again for the next traveler. It's an important point. He puts it in and he starts cranking and he starts cranking and he starts cranking and it's squeaking and it's making all kinds of sound when all of a sudden a drop of water comes out and then another drop and then another drop and then another drop. And then it begins to pour out, cold, refreshing water. He, he, he filled up the jug, poured the old water out, filled up the jug, drank it, filled it up again, drank it. And then he did what the note said, leave it for the next person. So he filled it back up, put a cork on it. And then he wrote a little note on the bottom. It really works. It really works but you have to give it all away before you'll receive it. It's really what the gospel says, doesn't it? John three sixteen. for God so loved the whole world that he gave his only son that whosoever would believe, that, that that belief is what unleashes all of God and his salvation in our life and, and we begin to trust him. You have to, like this man did, you, you have to give, you give your life away to Jesus and say, you know, I've tried everything that I could do. I've kind of messed up my life, but Lord, I'm gonna put my trust. I don't know everything, but I'm gonna put my trust and my faith in you and it becomes a win, win. Paul then was, would continue to write in that first chapter of Philippians to the church that he loved so much. And he says, I pray, in verse 9, he says, I pray that your love will overflow more and more and that you will keep growing in the knowledge and understanding. He says, I, I want this to happen to you. He knows that if you're going to get to the win-win decision in your life, if you're going to get to that level, which is where we all want to go, all want the win-win. He says, then then you're going to have to grow. He says, I'm praying that your love will overflow. And notice how love is tied in with knowledge and understanding. In other words, as my love grows for God and for others, then my knowledge about Jesus, about God, and my understanding will begin to grow. That takes time and dedication. You know, the first time I saw Leanne, was in a Bible study. 
at Iowa State. I didn't know her name, didn't know where she was from. I did know she was very pretty. That's the only thing I knew. And so, I, you know, tried to make small talk with her. I was awkward at best, and that didn't go over so well. And she turned me down when I asked her out for three times. And this is a great lesson in persistence. Never give up, guys. Never give up. Finally, she said yes. We went on a date, and and I learned a little bit about her. I learned that she was from Green Mountain, Iowa. I'd never heard of Green Mountain near Marshalltown. I learned more and more I grew, that she grew up on a farm. And then, you know, I, I start, we start spending more time together. And every time we spent time together, I began to learn more and more about her, what she likes, all those kinds of things, what she doesn't like. We, I begin to discover more about her life to the point, as you know, it progresses, well, I'd like to spend the rest of my life with you. Now, I want you to know something that that even though this next month, no, <laughs> a month and a half, a month and a half, November 15th, we will have been married for 40 years. Now, this is going to sound strange, and you're going to think, well, I'm just, it's because I'm old. But I want you to know that I love to hold her hand as much now as I did then, 40 years ago. That that for us, I know, I know this is going to sound strange, but for us, it's kind of like a date night to go to the grocery store and shop. I know you're thinking, it's because you're old. I understand that. But I just love being with her. And she'll say, hey, go get me this in the store. And I'm off like a golden retriever after, you know, catch a bottle or whatever it might be. And I come back, you know, and put it in the cart. And, uh, you know, I'm getting carried away here a little bit. But anyways, this, this idea is that I love to be with her. And I know a lot of the things, I mean, I just know what she likes. I know what she doesn't like. We've spent 40 years together. I can tell you this. I have greater appreciation for her. I love her more than I loved her the day I said, I want to marry you. I just love her more. I've learned, I've spent time. You see, isn't that the way it is with Jesus? He said, I pray that your love will overflow more and more, that you'll grow in knowledge and understanding. And the same thing here that was in my relationship with Leanne is so true about God, and it's where it's so important that our, he's saying, I need your love to grow. you got to love, and if you love, you'll want to spend time, and if you spend time, then you'll grow in knowledge and understanding by the reading of God's word, by devotions. He says, I, I'm praying that you keep growing, because when you keep growing, it's when you can see the win-win, but you can't see it. Until you grow in your faith. It is in this next verse, because today, um, if you're at the live service that will be outside, it's Confirmation Sunday, and we have a lot of Confirmation students. And I really think that this really fits, because as you notice this, he says, I, need, I want your love to grow, and I want you to grow in knowledge and understanding of God. And I just want to put a plug in here, like if... If you have a Bible and it's old English, then give that to somebody else and get a Bible that you can understand in the, in the language that we can because it makes such a difference. The, the one that I'm reading from, which is, by the way, the same version that you see on your screen, the New Living Translation, is much easier to understand. And so don't let those things be hindrances on growing in our knowledge and understanding. Be a part of this. And the other thing is, if you're watching this online right now, is you can download the study notes. And you don't have to be in a small group. Maybe you're not able to. Maybe you live a distance from this church. But you can go through those as a family, as a couple. And and we can keep growing in our knowledge and understanding because notice what happens as as, we, as, he, as Paul begins to move here, he goes one step further and he says, for I want you to understand, I want you to understand what really matters. Oh, it's such an important thing, not just to confirmation students, but this is so critically important to all of us. He says, I want you to understand what really matters because some people just go off chasing all kinds of things in this world because we are the summation of all of our choices. 
And he says, I want you to understand what really matters so that you may live a pure and blameless life. You need to know that if you go down this route, it doesn't lead to anywhere. It's not going to lead to anything good. But if you grow in your knowledge of Jesus and understanding, see, you'll begin to see what path is the right path, and the Holy Spirit will lead us on that so that we can understand what really matters. It's October 1999 in New Zealand and 300 pilot wells beached themselves on a deserted island and they died. Marine biologists came in, they couldn't believe this this tragedy of these 300 pilot wells dying. And they wanted to know why. And they were chasing, apparently, a school of a, a small white fish. They, they loved to eat them, but they were chasing them. And, and they were getting so excited about trying to eat these. There was a, just a large school that the fish lured them into the shallow waters. And so wanting to eat these fish, they literally, one after the other, just beached themselves. How often have we done the same thing to ourselves? Chasing after the things that don't really matter in life. Things that even though we we know they don't matter, but we still chase after them. And what, what Paul is trying to say to the church, see, his choices are limited in the jail. Their choices are not. He says, think about this. Grow in that love and that knowledge and understanding of Christ because if you do that, if you do that, then, then you're going to understand much clearer what really matters in life. It is through God's word that we really discover what really matters. And it begins to change our life. We're not perfect. The good news is, remember, God's not done working on us. He's continuing to work. Paul started this whole section that way. He says, first thing I need you to know is that God began to work in you. And he's going to continue that work until it's finished. So we're not perfect. We've made mistakes. We've gone sometimes in the wrong direction. But he says, listen, we're going to keep growing in our love and understanding of God because as we do that, then we're going to understand what really matters. If there is one thing I'd like to say to every confirmation student, every young person, every student that goes off to college, understand in life what really matters because it's only by doing this and living out these verses that we can get to the the win-win of our life, which is where we find ourselves going right now. So Paul, he's, he's kind of wrapping this decision up, and, and you can imagine in, in jail and chained to a guard, even though he's under what we might consider some type of a house arrest, he can have visitors. He's never away from the guard that he's chained to 24-7 for two years. And he understands this idea of freedom. And, he, and I'm sure he has played out this scenario just like we do all the time. Well, I wonder how this is going to go. On the one hand, I could be executed. But perhaps they will let me go free. I don't know what way it will go. And I'm sure he, he played out, you, you know how it is when you're in a crisis situation, how your mind begins to wander and go and kind of explore all of the possibilities of what might or what could happen. Well, I wonder how the execution would be. Will I be strong? Will it be quick? Will I suffer? Will I bring honor to God in the way that I die? You see, all of those things are just playing out in his mind. Will I be free? And if I'm free, where will I go and, and minister? And all these things are playing out. And as he begins to contemplate those decisions, he comes down with the idea that he, he has two choices. Either he will be found guilty and then he will be executed or he will be freed. It's at this point that he begins to write in Philippians 1.20. This is where the win-win starts to appear. For I fully expect and hope that I will never be ashamed, but that I will continue to be bold for Christ. I will continue to share this message of the gospel as I have in the past, 
And I trust that my life will bring honor to Christ whether I live or die. Paul's not sure. He's just not sure what's going to happen, but, I, but I'm convinced that with, with whichever decision is made, and if I'm freed or if I'm executed, I, I want my, my life to bring honor to Jesus. If he lives, he says, if I live, it means that I can work more for Christ. And if I die, which he says is even better, then I go be with Christ. He says, I'm torn between these two things. It's not that Paul is going to try to inflict anything so that he will die. That would be wrong. That wouldn't be right. That wouldn't bring honor to Christ. It is God who calls us when he calls us, when it's beyond our decision. He says, I'm not sure what's going to happen with either way. And then he gets to his famous line, which is probably the most quoted line out of the book of Philippians. For to me, living means living for Christ. And dying is even better. Often translated like this, you may have heard, to live is Christ, to die is gain. So in other words, he's reached this point when it really is a win-win. If they release me, which is a win, then I can do more ministry with others. So I want you to know that you have a ministry. You might think, well, I'm not a pastor. I never went to seminary. None of that stuff. That's okay. It's okay. God has a ministry and a place for you. It might be to pray for people. Different missionaries pray for for those who are suffering and going through difficulty. It might be writing encouraging notes or emails or text. It, it, might, it, it might be supporting others. There's all kinds of things. We, we always will have ministry. So Paul says, you know, if I live, I know that it means ministry for others. And then here, but if I die, a faith so secure in Christ, so, so confident in what Jesus has for him in heaven. You see, that's even the best. I mean, that's the best of all things is to be with Jesus. Now, I want you to know, um, this is hard for us. It's hard for me. Living here in America, we have a lot. And we don't want to leave this world until our time is up. But for Paul, the fear is completely gone. It's gone. I have memorized this verse, not in this version, but, you know, to live is Christ, to die is gain. And I have pondered it over and over again, different times in my life. It really is gain. Paul really gets it. Paul is living a life the way we all hope to aspire to, which is the win-win life. It's a win-win. If I'm alive, I'm in ministry for Jesus, which is for all of us, not just pastors. It's for all of us. If If I'm alive, I'm in ministry. I'm doing something for the kingdom of God, which is what matters most. But if he takes me, if he, not me, if he takes me, that's the best. That's the best. You see, Jesus is building the most wonderful place called heaven, the series that we did, for all who have faith in him, for all of us who by faith poured out our life to him and said, you know what? I can't believe that you want me, but if you do, which is hard for me to believe because I don't even like being with myself, then here I am. For all of us who've done that, all of us who made that decision, then we will live with Jesus forever. And he began the work in our life. I want you to know something. If you, before I conclude this message, if you go back and watch the daily devotional from Friday, just look back for Friday's devotional. I I shot that video in the basement of the Iowa Falls Methodist Church where... 43 years ago, I accepted Jesus Christ as my Savior. It made all the difference in the world. I want to tell you something. I walked up out of the steps of that basement of that church. My life was changed. 
he had already been working on me. He'd been working on me. And he continues to work on me. I'm not perfect yet. Just ask Leanne. I'm not perfect. It's, I'm not there yet. I, I want to be, but, but I, I'm going to keep going. And he says, I understand other people might not say it, but Jesus says, John, you're my masterpiece. And, and I'm trying to love God more and more. And I'm growing in more knowledge and understanding. And I like to be with God and reflect on God and pray and worship Jesus. And I am trying to live into this verse. For all of us who have faith in Jesus, it's a win, 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 win. May God help that come alive in our hearts and our lives as we grow in our faith. It's the most incredible thing of all, the win, win with Jesus. Pecan, sugar pie, win, win. Great ministry down here, great relationships, being with Jesus forever, win, win. Let's pray. Lord, I thank you for your love, which is so incredible that you would love me. What a message, Lord. Just the fact that I was just, I was just in Iowa Falls in that room where I knelt and received you as a savior. You've not stopped working on me. There's times, Lord, I, I start going down some different trails, but you were there. Bring me back. Not give up on me. You kept after me. Thank you, Jesus. For all of us, Lord, we just want to be able to live into the win-win mentality for all who have faith in you. So Jesus, remind each person today, remind us, Lord, that you began a work in us because you love us and you're not going to stop working in this life. You will always work on our life, bringing us to the point where we will really understand what matters in life, what really matters, Jesus, is you. So help our love for you and others to grow. Help us grow in our understanding and our knowledge that we might be able to make the right choices, the best choices in our life. Sometimes, Lord, it's not just there's a wrong choice and the best choice. Sometimes it's the best choice versus just a good choice. Help us, Lord, to, to be able to work through that, to do the best choices that we would have to bring glory to you. And then, Lord, I pray you would help all of us to live into that verse, Paul, that Paul said, which was so incredible, to live is Jesus, to die is even gain. And Lord, help us because that's fearless living. It's living without the fear in our life. It's, it's being able to live and say that Jesus has a plan for me. He's working on me. And if I'm to remain here, I got, I'm going to be working for the king, for King Jesus. And, it, and it, Lord, if you should call me home, well, that's the best to be with you forever. And we just thank you, Lord, for those verses. Thank you for the writings of Paul and Jesus for your love and your grace to us. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Well, God bless you. Well, listen, I invite you to right now, if you think, just download the study guide for this lesson. Download it. There's a number of questions that'll talk you through. You'll learn more and be able to reflect on that. Do that with your family, your spouse, some friends, and God bless you. Keep growing with us. We'll see you next week as we all have joy.